So Graham Wallace from Continued Sound, thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And congratulations on launching a new record label. As I said, it's called Continued Sound. And uh, why don't you tell me and the audience a little bit about the journey that you were on, which, you know, kind of inspired you to open up, uh, set up your own shingle in the mm-hmm. music uh, music reissue world. Gosh, I guess it starts from, you know, a love of music, a love of all different types of music, and then sort of as a creative person, you sort of mature and sort of realize maybe how things start to work, how record labels start to work. I'm just right. a very curious person by nature. And, um, you know, I was always collecting vinyl and DJing and just finding ways to sort of express myself as sort of a music curator of sorts. And, right. um, yeah, I sort of probably around the pandemic time, I started looking into how one even reissues anything or just licensing and that sort of behind the scenes sort of music world in general. And right. um, yeah, it was a slow sort of process of researching, you know, soul music, you know, researching New Jersey soul and, all, you know, getting, getting little bits and pieces to sort of put together a puzzle that is what continued sound and the label sort of eventually grew to be. It was never, I set out to start this label. Like now sort of, let me, work backwards as to how to do that it was sort of like oh i've this this music needs to come out somewhere right right by the way i like your headphones you've got really cool headphones. oh my gosh yes we real recognize real we have the we it's like wearing the same dress to an event we've worn the same address to uh, the same dress to an event we're wearing the same (laughs) headphones. how embarrassing so mortified Graham, how did you sort of, um, it's, you, you mentioned, you know, you were a DJ, you've, you've been collecting records for a long time, but how do you uh, talk a little bit about building that New Jersey collection? Obviously, the first release uh, for the label is a, is a mind blower for me. It's called The Soul of <laughs> New Jersey. It's volume one. And uh, our show's audience knows that I uh, conduct the program. I'm, I'm here in New Jersey right now. I'm a lifelong Garden State resident. So how did you sort of put together your... Uh, you know, talk about your collection, maybe your DJing and how you sort of found these discs and said, hey, this is something that I'd like to get to a wider audience somehow. Gosh, it all goes back to, you know, being born and raised in New Jersey, being um, gravitating towards, you know, first as a as a young man, hip hop music. And I was even a rapper myself at one point and cool. got yeah. got to be got a crew of guys sort of making music and of all types, but for me, it was mostly hip hop. And then growing you, I think anyone sort of into hip hop does the natural um, archeological, like where did this beat come from? Where did right, who right. sampled this song? And then that opens up a portal into the wonderful world of all sorts of wacky samples and soul music. And yeah, I think I just got curious about my, my state's history, you know, it's everything with hip hop, with a lot of things associated with New Jersey, it just kind of gets lumped in with New York. And a lot of people don't know that even with hip hop, like the Fugees and all these great acts are from New Jersey and not New York. Um, So I loved, I loved that. I always had that kind of Jersey pride. And then when it came to the soul music, I won quickly, you know, New Jersey soul won quickly goes to um, Sugar Hill and Sylvia Robinson and realizing that, you know, Rapper's Delight came out of New Jersey and um, all these great soul records that people know and, and are sampled and everything like this is so that that lit the fire, I think, in me to then keep digging and see sort of what hasn't been released, what hasn't been sort of celebrated and try to get that to the into the light. Cool. Uh, you know, one of the characteristics of, and, and as you mentioned, New Jersey's always in, the, we're always in the New York City shadow here, especially in the North, of course, where mm-hmm. I am. Uh, but one of the characteristics of music from New Jersey is its audacity. You know, it's really ambitious. And if you're really listening to New Jersey artists, it, you, sometimes that music reach it, reaches for heights that's just out of reach. It's really dramatic <laughs> and it's exciting in a bold way. You know, and it, you think about uh, Springsteen or the Four Seasons, those guys, and, um, you know, you kind of get that feeling and as you listen to this playlist what are some of the commonalities that you feel about you know this music that you uncovered from the garden state maybe with like a a little bit of an attitude you know was there anything that you felt like uh you know if you if you had to put some commonalities on some of these songs did you get that vibe at all yeah definitely i think it has 
it has the luxury of perhaps even being in the shadow of New York, but not being New York, where you have the, to your point, audacity to try new things and be really bold, but right. not feel, you know, if it's anything like hip hop and anything like uh, almost all genres that sort of do have a sort of geographic context. And if something sort of comes out of New York and you listen to enough things from New York or the South, Georgia or anywhere, you're like, oh, there's characteristics. And then that sort of can almost be uh, a blessing and a curse where it's like you want to associate with where you're coming from if it has any sort of caliber. But New Jersey being sort of this, it's the suburbs, it's the city, it's the country in places. And I think you can be eclectic. And I think what the playlist is, is pretty eclectic. There's a lot of cool, like, instrumental band stuff with some latin influence and then there's just some straight soul and some sweet soul and it can sort of be from it feels very eclectic but and i think that just comes from the spirit of being from a place where you have the perhaps the skill the audacity the 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 ambition but you have maybe some room to play and you don't have perhaps the shadow to sort of feel you are indebted to a type of sound Right. Where were you from in New Jersey? You you grew up there. Here. I grew up in the yeah in Morris County, a little town called Madison. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. We discussed <laughs> this. Of course, I went to Fairleigh Dickinson. I was yeah. on the, the FDU radio station for many many years, but I was up here in Teaneck. But the main campus is really in uh, Madison. It's very beautiful down there. Yeah, yeah. I grew up right next to like sort of the outskirts of Madison proper, but it was right next to the university. Right, right, right. And of course, down near there is Princeton Record Exchange, which is the uh, record buying mecca here in, in uh, New Jersey. It's not far away from Madison. Yeah. And we were not too far from, you know, WFMU and the FMU record fairs and stuff like that in Jersey City. And yeah, I didn't make it down to Princeton that often, but definitely in the in the greater sort of Jersey City Hoboken area, there was lots of digging right, to right. be had definitely so um you know the opening track of the album is by a group called the soul, soul generation it's called that's the way it's got to be and it's really a fabulous almost like a shy lights uh, style song and uh can you tell us a little i guess you know one of the other questions i wanted to ask you was um i didn't get the i don't have it on in hand but i imagine there's great stories behind all of these tracks that uh do, you know did you do a lot of archaeological kind of uh, research or digging around are there are there little stories about these tracks that you're uh, you know of or that are that are sort of in the packaging? Yeah. Um, in talking to these two gentlemen in particular that I sort of dedicate the, the record to is where I sort of, you know, beyond beyond these conversations, I, I came to them with just like, hey, your name is associated with this group and that group. And, I, you know, maybe you're credited on the Internet as a as a producer. But what was your relationship? And right. Yeah, in talking to Paul Kaiser, who was associated with Soul Generation, that was his, he went to high school with all those guys and just grew up around them and grew up making music. And it was their first real band that got some, got some attention, got some, some clout. And he just sort of, he wrote a lot of the songs with them and he was sort of their producer guy behind the scenes that helped them sort of. And I wish I was around at the time. I wasn't, I think they charted in some capacity, but I don't know if they really blew up and then. Unfortunately, in talking to Paul, like like a lot of first time sort of forays into music as groups, you know, tensions and success and things right. sort of made them go apart and, and certain relationships were were damaged as a result. Right, right. And um, and what about there is a, there is a little booklet in the in the record. Do you have a, a lot mm -hmm. of written stuff there? What, what, what do you have? What's sort of described there in the uh, in the package? Um, yeah, in the liner notes, I sort of do a, a, a forward sort of about New Jersey and, and you know, the I, I do a lot about the 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 Prince, not Princeton, the Trenton Bridge, you know, slogan on the side, you know, Trenton makes the world takes. Right. And I sort of extrapolate on that point, which I feel is very um, pertinent to the album and to Jersey music. And it's like you're there's a lot going on. There's a there's a spirit of of bootstrap can do attitude and and right. working hard and um sometimes unsung for your work but you know you have a, a a real sensibility to to work hard and have a lot of pride in your product and and then the world does take in in so much as it notices and you i think we have a great reverence for not just in new jersey but what comes out of new jersey 
Yeah, well, and again, it brings me back to thinking about Springsteen and, you know, particularly those early albums and just thinking of him as kind of a a hard-working musician uh, Mm -hmm. sleeping on the boardwalk and uh, doing his Bruce Springsteen thing. But, you know, a lot of that is very typically New Jersey. It's just this, uh, you know, some guy says, I'm going to do this, and then he Mm -hmm. kind of does it. He kind of pulls it together. So I imagine that a lot of the... uh, a lot of the acts on here, this was their big moment, you know, the, and, and, and again, as I say, what big moments they were, because each of these tracks is really as exciting as the next. I, I got the feeling that there, there's really a lot of killer, no filler here. How did you kind of, um, the, the album is only 10 songs. And of course it's, uh, it's volume one. So we, you've already, yeah. you've already hooked our interest for volume <laughs> two, three, four, and eight, nine, ten. But, You're so um, big. What how, what was your sort of um, filtering process? You know, how did you how many songs did you have to start with, and was it difficult to kind of chop it down to ten? Yeah, it can be tough to to come to. You know, first of first and foremost, I I cold called these two guys just as a eager sort of with an idea and with no idea as to what I was doing. So I just I knew if I got the got their phone numbers and started talking to them i would i would learn on the on the fly so i did have a uh, probably 15 or more songs that i knew i wanted and i'm sure a few were going to fall away for whatever reasons rights and and who has publishing and yada yada, yada. even yeah. though i didn't really know what any of that meant but i knew to, to sort of take a wider swing and that's, that's your own new jersey audacity there exactly right. and you know really having no idea. I'm trying to go back into that space about a year and a half ago where I was just like, it was all ambition and I'll be told I can't do it if I can't do it, but until I hear that. And that's sort of how the songs ended up boiling down to the track list we have is some were they didn't have the rights for, some were just, you know, dealing with guys who get sampled a lot. There was a lot of trepidation and um, also a lot of still things that around the music industry that I don't, that one day I'll learn, like if, if a track that I wanted was particularly popular um, in the sampling world, um, it didn't behoove them to have it go on the, on the compilation. Cause it's, you know, it's, it's popular. It's a moneymaker, I suppose. And right. so finding ones that were under the radar enough that these guys felt comfortable letting me use it also just sort of a trust in that these, these tracks aren't, you know, a hot commodity or people aren't going to come knocking when they hear the song and it's full ownership is with these two guys. And, um, but yeah, after that, I just feel like once you did have the, once I did have the, the collection, it was just sort of kind of making a mixtape, seeing how it flowed and, and what, to. I have two songs by a group called the escorts on, on George Kerr's side of the record and sort of, I have a, a danceable sort of upbeat one and then sort of a, a sweet soul one and sort of bookend the the track list with those um felt cool and yeah just sort of i really wanted the record to, to flow really nicely i really wanted it to feel upbeat and something you could dance to but also something that has a lot of musicianship and sort of to appeal to as many people as possible right so uh, do all of the songs on this compilation uh, harken back to the the two fellas you're describing? And I know they're they're highlighted on your website. Folks can check out. But why don't you tell everybody their names one more time? They're two men, Paul Kaiser and George Kerr. So and all of them had some stamp on each of these tunes. No, it's a A side and a B side. So the the one side that oh. has so side one with the Soul Generation starting off is George Kerr's um contribution and then the other I side see. is is paul kaiser or one some variety of the two they know one another and i worked with them sort of on group calls and i didn't know that at the time i didn't know right. when i'm talking to paul kaiser for the first time he just goes well i'll, I'll call him i'll see how he's doing right so they so they're they've worked together before and then um yeah finding their their own separate sort of tracks was a lot of fun that's interesting. So you sort of figured it out backwards. They're like, "Oh yeah, we we know." And you, and you "Oh, okay." You you had the you had the big light bulb moment. So that's interesting. So how did you go about? Um, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about the digi- digitizing process here. What I, it, I'm assuming these all seem like needle drops to me. Are they all pulled from actual vinyl? Were there any tapes at all to be used or anything like that? 
No, they, I think, um, like a lot of, like a lot of stuff actually from New Jersey. I don't know how familiar with the, the big fire that took out a lot of, um, the old, uh, Sylvia Robinson, Sugar Hill stuff and all platinum. And a lot of these, a lot of these, um, old records were destroyed and, yeah, I couldn't get any original tapes. They were needle drops, but I sent the so I purchased up all of the all of the material and sent it to a, a mastering place that um, does this kind of thing all the time. And he said that his his digitation digitation process was digitation digitizing process was digitization state, digitization I, I was have, look it up look, look it yeah. up audience <laughs> um, was state of the art. And he got you know he went in and he took out pops and and hisses and right. made it sound incredible so who was it that did that work a guy named alan dochis who works at um his company is called west west side music and it's in the hudson valley i believe oh, okay and another another moment of just puzzle pieces falling together i sort of reached out to the internet on instagram or just does anyone know someone who works in this capacity who uh remasters old stuff and an LA contact that I have sent me over to to Alan. And then when I got to talking to Alan, I dropped these two names and Alan says, you know, I used to, he's like, wait a minute, did you say Paul Kaiser? I said, yeah. He's like, I used to work for Paul Kaiser when I was about 19 years old. Oh my God. And I don't even, I don't even know how old Alan is now, but it must've been 30 or 40 years ago. And I got to reunite those guys. He wanted his number and Paul wanted Alan's number and wow. they- yeah, it was it was very cool. So he, it's, I mean, getting him on board was easy because as soon as he knew what I was up to, he was more than happy to lend his skill to it. Well, sure, and it makes a big difference that he had maybe maybe some familiarity with the music or at least with the sound. You know, he knew what you were what you were going for. So I'm sure our audience would be curious to learn about you know you finding these discs did you did you go through a you know grueling process of looking for stuff or did you have fairly clean copies of these to to use or sometimes i know uh which i recently learned about uh is that these folks will take maybe two copies one of which maybe the the beginning of the disc is in good shape but the end of it is bad and then they'll find another one where the end is okay but maybe the beginning isn't good and kind of fuse them together so how did you kind of get the raw materials i think it started i forget the first one that i owned was just in my natural state of just digging and, and finding old stuff but then when i was trying to compile things i i looked on the internet and luckily you know there's resources like discogs or something that will sure. tell you tell you the condition that it's in and so you have that going for you where you can go on find a website that tells you you can find it and purchase it but sometimes the copy you want is in france or something if you you have to weigh do i want to do i want something shipped to me from far away that's in better condition or do i want to get something that's in less less pristine condition and it's and closer the, by and the shipping can be uh, more than the disc oh almost always yeah <laughs> um so um but i for the soul generation i found a copy that was in great condition but it was also a european release there's if you google soul soul generations album uh, body and soul it's usually the same black and white cover of them in front of a building but the one i found in france was this super cool photo of them all dressed in these like trench coats and looking awesome so i was like i just need to have that one yeah you needed that. that's worth the price so so it sounds like it was a pretty easy thing were any of these particularly expensive uh, i i'm not i i'm not really familiar with you know the 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 value of these obviously some of these uh, soul records can become very valuable but were any of them did, was one of one or, one or two of them maybe really hard to track down not really it came down to just um you know they were all in the ten dollar uh well the soul generation one from france was probably like 60 bucks right. but um they were all i think because i was even able to use them and and have any sort of access to using these tracks it was probably in part because they were overlooked and just sort of like great true to the spirit of what i'm trying to do like just great music that didn't that needed its shine and maybe the the B side was more popular than the A side or any combination of that where the fact that it was cheap and I was able to to get it and work with it cuz these guys have gotten you know getting to getting to talking to them they've they've had success with other big hits or certain bands they've worked with 
blew up and that's how they were able to make a living. But in the process of that, when they were younger or just something didn't, didn't get airplay, didn't, didn't pique anyone's interest at the time, just sort of fell into obscurity. So finding something like that, that sounds great. And you're able to share it was like, that's what it's all about. Right, right. So, so you get the, uh, the mastering done, you've get, you got these things to a place where you're happy that they sound. Um, and then the final master is completed. Where did you have the, this is available digitally. People can find this streaming on their, uh, their favorite streaming service, whatever they're using. Uh, but of course you do have a, a run of vinyl that's happening with these. So where were, where did you have the, uh, the records pressed? I got them pressed in Toronto, actually, at a place called Microforum, which I thought did a, an amazing job. And that was also the learning process of figuring out what what plants are where and who does right. what. It was I didn't go into this with any knowledge of how that all works. I wasn't sort of an industry person who knew, oh, this is an easy route I can take. Everything was sort of a learning process. Which and, is better sometimes. Yeah, sometimes ignorance can be your greatest strength of just yeah. like i've never done this before so you teach me you tell me how to do this what do I um, do? yeah yeah so and yeah the more i know the more i can maybe explore and and find out different places to get things pressed but because there's a lot of great places now that i know of um uh in the states but that isn't to say microforum in in toronto did a really great job and the the prints the everything looks fantastic they did the printing too. Do they have the uh, the printing capability at that factory as well. They did, yeah. And you know, it was a bit of a mystery because they they're working on a, a shipping schedule, and I, you know, they didn't always. It wasn't always like step by step. Here's how it always. Here's going to look. Here's the here's a proof. We're going to send you a a copy of the jacket so you know what it looks like. It was kind of blind faith, and oh. I was like, oh, I hope I don't get a a, a thousand records that look kind of crappy I hate, um right. but they look it just looks fantastic and i was i was blown away that's good so th did they cut the lacquer there do you know if uh if they had a is there a specific person that cut the lacquer or maybe it was just their house person that did it from the i guess from the digital file that your uh, mastering engineer provided them yeah i sent over the highest quality um i think wave files from the mastering house and they cut the lacquer there in-house so um and they hang on to it there. Right. No, they sound good. I mean, everything sounds, again, I was imagining that everything was a, uh, um, uh, a, you know, from, from a disc, but everything sounded really good. There was a lot of separation and uh, the, the guy did a, a nice job, I think. Yeah, I was really, really impressed. And, and I'm, I'm able to, you know, put them side by side and realize, wow, there was some surgical work that went into some of these hissing sort of old that old record sound which i like as a as a record nerd but you don't you might you might want to achieve that organically over time and not have to buy a disc with it baked in well, well it's true i mean you know people get um excited for those analog you know they people want to use the tapes and even if they digitize the tapes you know you get that that quieter background but i think with this project it, it's fun you know it reminds you hey i'm listening to records you know this is a guy's collection and it's almost like obviously the the fidelity is better than if you were just playing them on the radio or something like that but that's kind of what the feeling was this guy brought over 10 of his favorite records and he wants to play them and uh, they happen to be really particularly clean sounding uh versions of these albums or 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 45 was anything cut off of a 12 inch or were they all off of a seven inch uh seven inch records no the escorts and soul generation were were full lps oh, okay um and yeah i think to your point they they have sort of the best of both worlds where you can you're listening to it at a high sort of rate that we're almost used to as consumers in 2023 of this this sounds great the levels are nice but the the integrity of the tracks i think not not for any uh component of age but just you know you're definitely transported i think when you're listening to you can hear the the time and and um the place and time from each track and cuz a lot of them have their own story and i think that does come through so i feel like as a vinyl appreciator and but also sort of an audiophile you you get both yeah 
Yeah, I agree. Um, most of the acts on this album were kind of new to me, uh, but the escorts are known pretty well, around, especially here in New Jersey uh, circles and also in you know regular soul and R&B circles. And they, they formed in Trenton State Prison, which I'm sure you know this story, and they mm-hmm. recorded some of their work in a mobile recording studios while they were in prison. And I don't have uh, your actual disc, but but again, this is another one of these, uh, these great stories um, that people should really be aware of it's it's just a crazy story these guys met in prison and and prison kind of brought them together to to do this and they they had a decent career out of it yeah i mean george it was the back to the audacity george kerr just being sort of a visionary he told me on the phone that he discovered them at a talent show and he went to uh rawway i think it was rawway uh penitentiary talent show and discovered them and was able to just, I think it was just a lot of letter writing, you know, right. You know, getting a, getting a bunch of prisoners to cut a record for you isn't and shouldn't be an easy thing to do. Right. And he even got them on one occasion to leave. He got these prisoners who are ostensibly imprisoned for, for something real, very real reasons and shouldn't be removed from the prisons. Yeah. Um, He finagled a way to, to take them out and have them perform live for a, for one or two performances, I forget. But uh, the way he got to do it was he befriended, you know, people at the prison, but also the money generated from those shows was put back either into the prison or into some sort of programs that that benefited sort of the, the institution. So it's just you got to love the the spirit of George Kerr, the the vision, and and I felt on a much smaller scale, sort of a kinship of like, yeah, you can, if you have a weird, wacky idea, keep going until you're told there's no way. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah just keep at it. The the tenacity. Keep doing it. And that story in particular is a, it, it sounds like a, a great, make a great movie, make a great uh, film about it, you know, be, wow. People just wouldn't be able to believe. I'm sure. I mean, we only know, you know, it'd be interesting to sit down with these guys, whoever, whoever experienced this and really get the nuts and bolts of the story. I'm sure there's a lot more to it that, that we don't even know that would just astound you. I'm sure. I know he tells me a, a documentary is in the, in the works. So fingers crossed. Um, and he's, he's, he said he's spoken with filmmakers who want to tell this story. I, on the audio side of things would love to, you know, the big dream of mine is to compile and and remaster and sort of have a, a definitive escorts sort of vinyl box that you can, mm. that gives you all the stories and, you know, has, has a booklet with all the information and just sort of on the audio side of things, just a definitive collection of their work. That would be cool. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt our conversation. I can't help it because <laughs> where are they? Hold on one, hold on one second. Okay. Oh, here they are. I should have grabbed it before I uh, all right. sat down with you. But how could we be talking about them and and not? There they are. Yeah, this is my copy. Three down, four to go. <laughs> so there, and of course you've got the lock and key on the front yeah. cover. And uh, uh, what so? I don't think that song was. This uh, might have been their, this is their second songs. one. Disrespect yeah. can wreck. Uh, corruption. We've gone too far to end it now, brother. I only have eyes for you. The show enough. The show enough. La la. Within, without. I can't stand to see you cry. And this was, of course, owned by someone with the last name King. And uh, <laughs> yeah, three of the seven escorts have paid their debt to society. Others are expected to be released from Rawway in 1974. Somebody circled 1974 as though they were Interesting. keeping track here. <laughs> and this now famous singing group has been accepted purely on their talents as recording artists. So pretty cool. Pretty cool. That's story. so cool. Does it say, does it credit George Kerr on the back of all, some of those songs? I think him and Burt Keys were the two guys that I'm sure a couple are covers, but as far as production, George it, Kerr, George yeah. Kerr, and George Kerr. George cool. Kerr is on two, and this is on Alethea Records, 1974. Yeah. From North Bergen, New Jersey, a North Bergen, New Jersey label. So cool. So this is exciting. This is a new record label. Congrats. Congrats to you, of course, again on that. And it's a a volume one of a exciting project that could go for several volumes here. Uh, So you've got your hands full, but are you thinking about what's, what do you think you might do next with the label? Any thoughts? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm only getting started with the Jersey Soul. I want to really establish that. I was, I, you know, my research, you know, there's a lot of record labels that want to celebrate the soul music out of their out of their hometowns, home states. And I was surprised that New Jersey didn't have sort of a, a celebration and looking back and of, you know, something already called the soul of New Jersey. I was so thrilled to be able to, to have that associated with my label. And I'm um, yeah, just getting started. These guys are, are such friendly guys and they've got, I love just bands like uh pride of the ghetto and, they, so they haven't, there's the A side of that 45 and then there's a B side that's also terrific. And, oh. and that's it. That's the exist. That's the extent of the existence of that particular group. They would go off and maybe be backing bands for other projects. Yeah, that but, was their entire catalog was that. Yeah. Record. So to be able to put out, you know, reissues of, of the 45s um, for a lot of these acts would be amazing. And yeah, definitely a, a definitive escorts sort of two disc compilation is very much on my radar and yeah just tons of projects i think what i'm what i'm learning about this reissue game is you reach out there's interest and you just you stick with it and you have the audacity to keep going and and not rest until you've you've gotten an answer and you've gotten a product because it's you're trying to reissue things that people can't readily go to the store and buy and you want to compile the best music you can and and find it and the 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 thrill of it for me is being able to show people something that you've sort of discovered and you want to elevate yeah and it's more exciting that in the 21st century it's something that isn't easily read, read, readily available and yeah you're, you're bringing it to light and that's uh, really exciting that's what it's all about absolutely no oh, cool well graham again congratulations on the on the label and on the release and i'm excited about it and i'm excited to see uh where else your audacious record <laughs> label journeys take you and if you follow continued sound on any of those any of the platforms you know i'll be i'll be blasting it out the closer we get to it cool and of course your website uh also you can purchase the album on the website is that right yes continuedsound.com anywhere else that you can purchase the record or just there right now or, or um now? from me um directly that'd be the easiest way i've i've uh gotten a distribution deal through uh, fat beats and they're going to be putting it into stores um not quite sure what stores those are yet but um yeah there's a big plan to have it in lots of record shops around the country cool you, but you got to go through you which i like i but, like that <laughs> but if you want, I mean, you can go hopefully with, with the distribution, it'll be in lots of, lots of places, but yeah, I think the best way to do it is to go to continued and That's pick up a copy. That's the way to do it. All right, <laughs> cool. Well, Graham, listen, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate you sharing the story with me and with the audience and, uh, and again, best of luck. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.